Welcome. Today we'll talk about the medieval church and the beginning of universities. But first, let's have a little thought question. To what extent was the medieval church the promoter of creativity? And an accompanying thought question, to what extent was the medieval church the inhibitor of creativity? I think that these two are very important questions. There, there are, of course, various opinions on both sides. Let's just talk for a moment about the medieval church and how it promoted creativity. The church was just about the only legitimate, long-lasting, continuously strong organization in the medieval world in Europe. Therefore, whatever creativity they had, if it was institutional, it would come through the church. The church also sponsored creativity for the purpose of religion. Beautiful buildings, although somewhat early in the medieval period, the buildings were uh, of a style that was not especially appealing to the modern person. Nevertheless, during those days, it was considered to be creative and very beautiful. In addition to that, the church fostered um, some uh, cultural creativity. They tried to get people to uh, continue with a strong religious belief and, and when there was uh, some creative thing that they could do to improve their, their religious practice, then they tried to do it. On the other hand, the church was interested in preserving itself and preserving the old traditions and therefore it discouraged change and by discouraging change of course it discouraged creativity. The church also tried to put a, a damper, a, almost like a blanket on any kind of progress other than progress within the, the seeking of, of improvements within the church and those improvements were generally building buildings in the traditional style and improving people's lives a person at a time. So I think we can see good and bad. Now let's take a look at those interactions between church and nations that we've already touched upon in previous lectures. With the rise of nations, the church started to lose political power. As we mentioned, around the year 1000, nations became strong and the church and the kings had about four to five hundred years of real struggle between them for preeminence. Uh, during the period that we will talk about today, that is uh, from about 1000 to about 13 or 1400, 1300, uh, during that period we see that the church was still generally stronger than the kings. But the people started to lose their affection for the church, their allegiance to the church, and replace it with an allegiance to the king. That doesn't necessarily mean that they stopped being Christians. It just means that the church wasn't the only thing in their life, the only thing that they centered their focus on. There were certainly other things such as um, their, the king and, and the place where they lived, and perhaps even later on their occupation and ways to improve that. So we see now some things that the church started to do to try and win the hearts and the minds of the people. One thing that happened around the year 1000 for the church is that there was a millennial fever. Let's read what Revelation says in chapter 20 verses 1 to 3 and we can understand why this millennial fever came about the year 1000. In Revelations it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, have the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, which is the devil, and bound him a thousand years. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Well, Christians believed that the thousand years began with the birth of Christ and therefore they reasoned 
they reassess their personal life and goal because they could see that Satan had been chained for a thousand years and then would have a brief period of being relaxed and loosed and then there would be a period of time uh, after that. So there was a millennial fever around the year 1000. Uh, that's somewhat similar to the feelings that other Christians had around the year 2000. They thought that that might also be a millennial year and the and the beginning of the millennium. Well, what did people do around the year 1000 to reassess their lives and change things? One thing they did is they went on pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a, is a trip to a holy site, and along the way you would have some suffering, not, not terribly bad, they hoped, but a little bit of suffering so that you would uh, begin to purge your sins. And then at the holy site you would say special prayers, and receive special blessings of forgiveness. Um, one of the reasons that pilgrimages became so popular is that the world was much safer. Uh, with the emergence of nations, there were uh, knights under the control of lords and kings, and those knights protected these uh, pilgrims on their journeys. Not only that, to help with the protection, the pilgrims wore uh, clothing that was of a particular style. Here we see a picture of a couple of pilgrims and you can see that that they had uh, shells on their clothes and large hats, usually wore staffs, and uh, that dress signified that they were a pilgrim and should be protected. So the purposes of the pilgrimage would be to draw close to God or perhaps to fulfill a promise or obligation. They might have said to uh, the Lord or to a priest that they would, they would uh, go on a pilgrimage to uh, uh, prove their faithfulness or if God forgave them of a sin then they would go on a pilgrimage. Those kinds of tit-for-tat um, promises were often made. In addition, they might share in grace that could be obtained at one of the pilgrimage sites because those sites had uh, more grace attending them because of the good works of people who had lived at that place. They might obtain a cure going to a, a location where there had been a miraculous cure would be an incentive to go back in hopes that there could be uh, a cure for you. And then sometimes, and I think not totally alone, perhaps joined in with some of the other purposes, is the spirit of adventure. Here are three of the most famous of the site locations. Uh, Canterbury, which is in England, and that is of course the place where um, there was a problem with Thomas Becket and he died and therefore that is a holy place because he was made a saint. Santiago de Compostela is in the uh, northwestern corner of Spain and that is, according to tradition, the place where the Apostle Santiago or St. James was buried. And then of course you could go all the way to Jerusalem and we see here on the map some of the favored routes of pilgrims as they went to those locations. There's also places of miraculous cures as I've already mentioned and places where visions may have occurred. And even today, those places continue to be places of pilgrimage for uh, Catholic saint, or Catholic uh, people. Now, in addition to that, we should look at the church as many people saw it. They saw it full of corruption. Uh, there were some councils that were organized. That is, bishops come together in a place and they have a discussion about how to change the church they were anxious to eliminate the power of the emperor in nominating who the pope would be or even approving who the pope would be. And therefore they established a new method of electing popes and that was to be through a college of cardinals who would come together upon the death of the pope and they would then elect a new one. Uh, this was also a time when the Church's rules of chastity were just simply ignored by most of the clergy, but there was a reaffirmation of those rules 
and therefore um, that particular part of the Catholic Church was strengthened. In addition to that, church authorities still focused on wealth and political position. The, the church had become the substitute for the Roman Empire within Western Europe. And just as the Roman Empire was an organization of power and prestige and wealth, so too the Catholic Church had become that kind of an organization. And uh, we see many of the church authorities more interested in those parts of the Catholic Church than they were in the spiritual part. And uh, bishops continued to be appointed from very powerful families, and in order to gain money, uh, church officials, especially popes, would sell uh, positions like bishops for money. That is a practice that is called simony. Um, there is also a, um, an order of uh, monks called the Benedictine Order that had dominated monastery life throughout the Middle Ages. At this point, uh, there was a lot of corruption that had grown up in that monastery life as well. The Benedictines had gained tremendous power through land holdings. Uh, it was not unusual for someone who uh, was a sinner, who was about to die, to try and, if you like, buy their way into heaven by donating land to the Benedictine monasteries. And therefore, these monasteries became fabulously wealthy in land, and that led to wealth in other ways as well. And therefore, the Benedictines around the year 1000 also needed to be reformed. One of the ways that that was done is to build a new monastery called Cluny. It was in central France. And Cluny became an, an archetypical reformed monastery. It became very, very large and it became an example for other monasteries throughout the Catholic uh, area. Let's take a look at a uh, short video on monasteries so that we can get a flavor for what monasteries were like around the year 100 or 1000 or perhaps a few hundred years later. The monasteries and convents of Europe were a society in themselves. For the faithful, they offered a life devoted to prayer, meditation, and the search for salvation. The monastic life was dominated by the rhythm of the seven hours of the liturgical day, which meant that seven times in the day monks had to be there in choir, singing and saying parts of the service. And that included getting up in the middle of the night. When you weren't taking part in liturgical services, your life was also rigorously regulated. In many monasteries, speaking was only allowed in certain places and at certain times. All privacy was removed from them. Their food was supposed to be very simple. Monks' clothing was also very hard, harsh, and uncomfortable. Why wear these clothes that made you so uncomfortable? Why go to all these services? Why eat such poor food? And the answer seems to be that it was by the renunciation of everything that the world regarded as comfortable, valuable, and so on, that salvation was to be achieved. The abbot was running a thriving trade in dyeing cloth. The monks had a brewery distilling a rather popular beer. While the monastery owned land across the neighborhood, 
making a tidy income from rent and tithes. All diligently accounted for in the monastery's extensive business records. The church wouldn't have pleaded for support from its people. It would have demanded it and required it. It had the power to levy tithes, which were not a voluntary contribution. They were a form of tax, which if you did not pay, you could be hauled up in court and made to pay. And people on the whole were willing to pay those fees because they were taught so firmly, right from their earliest childhood, that if they did not have the services of the church, their souls would be in peril. The monk's strict routine of prayer and study was accompanied by a regime of persecution of the flesh. Initiates were encouraged to sleep without coverings or blankets, even to whip themselves. One of the things they're trying to do is to imitate the sufferings of Christ, to be what is called an ascetic, to believe that by uh, dominating your fleshly desires by no longer needing food, sexual companionship, the comforts of life. You are identifying yourself with Christ in the wilderness, that you are battling with the forces of evil in yourself by battling with your own lower nature. Within a couple of hundred years, the reforms within the Benedictine Church or within the Benedictine order <clears throat> were considered to be insufficient for some people. And therefore, new orders were formed, new uh, monastic orders, in order to correct some of the problems. Uh, the Benedictines continued to be very isolated from society, and as we've talked about in previous lectures, people started to move into towns and cities. And those people who lived in towns and cities were largely unserved by any monasteries, and therefore new monasteries, new concepts of monasteries began around this time. And those monasteries thought that they would locate perhaps within the cities. Um, when they located within the cities, they could not own extensive land, and therefore they had to develop a new way to survive. They didn't have the money from land or farming, and therefore these new orders became what we call mendicant. Mendicant seems, it means simply beggars, and so they would beg for their sustenance from the members of their congregations. The first of these orders was called the Franciscan Order, and it was founded by a very righteous man, a a man loved by many people uh, in his vicinity named St. Francis of Assisi. His was one of those mendicant orders, and they believed very strongly in a literal interpretation of the scriptures and taught that uh, to all of the monks who went into that order. In addition to that, they believed in love, uh, a very strong love, not only for uh, humans, but also for all of God's creatures. And in fact, we sing the hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, and that's a hymn that was written by Francis of Assisi, the founder of this order. Um, this order tended to have a particular focus as far as righteousness is concerned, and that focus was to control the will. That is, if you will to do good, then you will obviously do good. And uh, if they had taken some wayward actions, then there was a strong feeling of repentance. So these, these Franciscans were well liked by the people in the cities because of their loving nature and their emphasis on this repentance and control of the will. Another one of the uh, new orders was called the Dominican Order, and it was founded by St. Dominic, a Spaniard, and this order was alternately called the Order of Friars Preachers, and they believed that the intellect
was the most important part that needed to be controlled. Whereas the Franciscans were the will, that is the determination, now the Dominicans believe that if you control the intellect or the mind, then that is the appropriate way to uh, live one's life. They uh, thought that understanding of true doctrine was critically important, and because of this association with the mind and knowledge and learning, the Dominicans became very important in universities, and we will see uh, in a few moments how the Dominicans came to dominate university life. Uh, the Dominicans took vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty, similar to those vows taken by the Franciscans, and um, where, whereas few Franciscans became involved in church politics, many Dominicans became involved in church politics and some became popes. So the Dominicans were a more outward, political kind of order than were the Franciscans. Um, there were some Dominicans who became famous painters. Frangelico and Frau Bartolomeo are two famous painters of this period who were both Dominican monks. It is said that the Dominicans and the um, Franciscans may have had an, an interesting occurrence that St. Dominic and St. Francis may have met each other. We believe that that occurred, and if so, they left uh, uh, that meeting with good feelings because there were initially, at least, very good feelings between these two orders. Well, one of the other points about the Dominicans is that they enforce the rules of the church, and that, of course, is the Inquisition Let's now talk about how the Spanish Inquisition and, by analogy, other inquisitions uh, arose. Here we see a map of Spain, and the colors on the map represent the various periods of reconquest, that is, periods in which the Christians were able to, little by little, drive the Muslims from the country. Um, the Christians gained territory beginning from the north and working toward the south. And finally, in 1492, the reconquest of Spain was complete. That is, the last Muslim rulers who lived in the city of Granada were expelled from Spain and the entire country became Christian. That was done, obviously, in 1492 under the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella, and they were called the Catholic monarchs to some extent because of their strong belief in the Catholic Church, uh, their ability to cast out the Muslims, and because they decided that they would purify the Spanish Church. And by so doing, one of the things that they did is to initiate a uh, forced conversion or an expulsion of all those who were not Catholic. Therefore, Jews, were either forced to convert or were sent away, and Muslims were forced to convert or sent away. And then, to ensure that all of those who converted were really converted, we see that the Inquisition was imposed in Spain. The Inquisition was a time when um, priests, often bishops, often from the Dominican order, would come into a city and they would uh, offer free forgiveness of sins to all of the people, or at least a uh, forgiveness of sin without penalty. And they would say, and we will allow this for the next period of time, say a month. And then they would listen to confessions and, and uh, help the people repent and uh, confess of their sins. Then after that period, Based upon the knowledge that they had gained from these uh, confessions, they would start to go after people uh, who may have failed to come in and repent and confess. And therefore, they started to hold trials for these people. And uh, even though it was a last resort, the Inquisition would be allowed to torture as a way of discovering the truth. And if the person was unrepentant, or if the 
sin was egregious enough, then the person could be killed by order of the Inquisition. Usually they would be killed by burning. Therefore the Inquisition had great power in Spain and uh, it was a very difficult time for those who did not live up to the very strictest of rules of the Catholic faith. That leads us to ask a question, should a church defend itself and punish heretics? Um, most people would agree that if the heretical movement was destroying the church or harming the church, then the church would have the right and perhaps would have the obligation to persecute or at least to um, stop that heretical teaching. One of the interesting questions that you might ask is about the LDS uh, disciplinary councils. Uh, I've been on some of those disciplinary councils as I sat on the high council in my own stake. And I could tell you that there is very little feeling of animosity, retribution, or anger. These are councils of love, and the purpose of the council is to improve the life of the person who is before the council. And uh, the object is not to get them to be um, punished, but rather to try and find a way to get them to repent or to change their lives so that they can be in harmony with the gospel. There's a very, very different feeling in the LDS councils than in these inquisitions of Spain. Well, one of the other consequences of this period of time, and frankly, for a couple of hundred years before and after, is the expulsion of Jews from various parts of Europe. Uh, here is a map that shows how the Jews were forced at various times to flee uh, various countries. There was a time for many, many years when Jews were excluded from England. And as we mentioned in 1492, how they were forced to flee from Spain. There were times when France excluded the Jews and later when Germany excluded the Jews. Many of them traveled in a generally easterly direction until they came to the uh, great expanses of Poland and Russia, and there the Jews found a home. The governments of those areas were generally happy to have the Jews come because the Jews brought skill and money, and they needed that uh, uh, skill and money to help those areas grow and develop. Therefore, we see that for many, many years, the strength of Europe, of Jews in Europe, would be in the eastern areas, Poland and uh, Russia especially. Now, let's, let's move to a new area, uh, an area of universities, a discussion of how the church tried to win the mind of uh, the leading people in Europe. The reason I say the leading people is because during this period of time, only those who were relatively wealthy were able to go to the university. Universities actually began in Spain and Africa. Perhaps the very first universities were in uh, North Africa. Some claim that Fez, the city of Fez in Morocco, was the original site of a university. And certainly there are several universities in Spain that are very large and very old. Um, these were probably started under Muslim rule um, and then later adopted by the Christians and taken over by the church. Christian Europe really began to emulate these uh, universities in the 11th and 12th century and we see some of the famous universities such as the University of Paris, Oxford University, and then a few years later uh, Cambridge. And these universities were often dominated by Dominicans as the Dominican order became stronger and stronger and uh, that's certainly consistent with the Dominican desire for controlling the intellect. So then we can ask ourselves this question and let's just think about it as we discuss universities. What is the value of a university with respect to creativity? We know that the university is all about teaching. We know that the university 
at least in modern days, is also about research. Uh, we might ask ourselves, is that true of the past? Were universities also places where new knowledge was to be discovered? Or is it simply a reiteration of past knowledge and an enforcement of the concepts that had already been worked out by, say, theologians or other professionals? Well, the concept of universities caught on very quickly. Here we see a map showing um, universities in the uh, latter part of the Middle Ages, and we see them in uh, many, many places throughout Europe, many of them, of course, in Italy, because Italy was a fairly advanced society during this period, somewhat ahead of the rest of Europe in terms of intellectual prowess. But there were other universities that were powerful outside of the uh, Italian peninsula. When you'd go to a university, you would go in and uh, begin your study toward a bachelor's degree. When you did that, you would enter the Faculty of Arts, and in the Faculty of Arts there were seven liberating arts. Today we call them the liberal arts, not because they're liberal in the political sense, but because they liberate one's mind from um, the restrictions of um, ignorance. Uh, the first three of those liberating arts are called the trivium, and those three are grammar, rhetoric, and logic. They all have to do with how you talk and how you explain yourself and how you convince others. And then, when you had completed the trivium, you were awarded a bachelor's degree. If you liked, you would then enter into a master's degree program, and that would be associated with the quadrivium, four particular areas of study, and those would be the applied arts, um, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And they were actually applied in the way of mathematics and science, mostly concerned with uh, understanding the world around us. Music, for instance, was less about playing an instrument than about studying the intervals and concepts associated with the mathematical side of music. Then if one wanted to continue beyond a master's degree, they would enter into a different faculty. Leaving the Faculty of Arts, they would become part of the Faculty of Theology or a faculty of medicine or a faculty of law, which were the three doctor's degrees that were granted by medieval universities. Then finally, um, a word or two about one of the problems, and that problem had to do with what happened in Paris. There was a argument between the faculty of arts and the professional faculty, especially the faculty of theology, which was the largest uh, graduate or PhD faculty in Paris. And that argument led to a split between the two faculties, and the faculty of arts decided that they would leave the campus where they had previously been located and go to a new place on the other side of the Seine River. So they went over to the left bank of the Seine and built a series of new buildings. That was all done with money given by a man whose last name was Sorbonne. Therefore, this new faculty of the arts, located on the western side of, the, or on the left bank side of the Seine River, was called the Sorbonne, and today it's known as the Sorbonne Still. And that area became known as the Latin Quarter because the students who lived in that area spoke Latin because that was the language of education. Now, in addition to universities, um, the learning within the Catholic Church was focused in monasteries. And monasteries had a particular way of teaching. Let's talk about this monastic learning method. Traditionally, teaching would be done by a, an abbot or perhaps one other highly uh, trained member of the monastic order. And that person would do what is called glossing. 
glossing is simply uh, you stand to read, open a text, almost always the Bible, and then you begin to read, and after you've read a few phrases, perhaps a verse or two, then you would stop and you would gloss on the verse. Glossing simply means elaborate on the verse. And we are told that one particular uh, man, Bernard of Clairvaux, taught glossing uh, extensively to the uh, monks who were under his control. And we're told that he gave 86 sermons from just chapters 1 and 2 of the Song of Solomon. Now, that's an awful lot of talking about an awful small amount of uh, material. I'm, I am surprised that he could give 86 sermons from such a small and somewhat meager resource as chapters 1 and 2 of the Song of Solomon. Nevertheless, that shows the wonderful capability of this man, Bernard of Clairvaux. He also was an author, and he wrote the uh, text for uh, another LDS hymn. Uh, Jesus, the very thought of you, beautiful hymn composed many, many centuries ago. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux was widely respected as one of the most righteous of men in his day. He was um, powerful enough to strongly influence the choice of a pope. He was powerful enough to encourage the king of France to go on a crusade to recapture Jerusalem. That's the origin of the Second Crusade. And there were other teachers, especially those in the University of Paris, that he disagreed with and criticized openly. And as we will see, his criticism resulted in some difficulties for those who taught by a different method. That other method, the alternate method to monastic learning, is called the scholarship method or scholasticism. Um, it became much more popular in the universities than in abbeys, where in universities there was less requirement for obedience and therefore more of an encouragement of thinking for oneself, which was uh, along with the scholastic method, whereas in, in uh, abbeys there was obedience rather than scholasticism that was important. Um, this method began in Paris around the year 1100, and it was based on the assumption that philosophy and theology are actually in ultimate agreement because if they are both true, then they both flow from the mind of God and therefore can have no conflict between them. Well, with that concept, then, people began to re-examine the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. And here I mean Plato and Aristotle in particular. Plato had been long recognized as uh, a valid authority within the Christian church ever since the days of St. Augustine back in the 5th century. But now, with the uh, texts that became available through Muslims, we find that Aristotle started to gain in credibility within the Christian community. Now, there's an interesting point here. Both Plato and Aristotle, of course, were pagans. Nevertheless, the concepts that they taught were adjusted to Christian theology, and therefore people said that Plato and Aristotle had a portion of the truth, and that portion of the truth was then expanded within the umbrella of the Christian church. Uh, theology was, in general, based upon revelation coupled with tradition from church fathers and church councils all the way through the medieval period. This is what a typical classroom would be like. In the morning, um, students and professors would discuss and certain readings would be given to the students, and those readings would be to uh, develop certain arguments for and against some proposals, and I'll give you examples of proposals in a moment. And then in the afternoon, the, after the readings, the students would gather with the professor and they would have a very spirited discussion, uh, citing examples for and against all of these proposals. 
um, they would generally use the didactic method, that is question and answer, defending yourself and attacking the other. Some of those topics might be, can God do everything? Very interesting topic. Or can a man see God? Or is it ever permissible to lie? Uh, this is the period of time when somewhat facetiously people started to talk about uh, medieval questions as uh, dealing with minutiae. For instance, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin is the old classic. And they probably did talk about things as uh, full of minutia as would be that uh, discussion. Now I'd like to talk about one of the teachers, a very famous teacher at the University of Paris. His name was Peter Abelard. Um, while he was a professor, he wrote a book. The book is called Sic et Non, which means simply yes and no. And um, in that book, he would go through a typical argument for the scholastic method. So he would give a proposition, he would give arguments for it and arguments against it, and then um, he would show counter arguments against the first arguments and so on. In this book, he decided that he would not resolve the question. He would not draw it down to a statement of theological proof. Because he didn't do that, um, he was criticized by the Pope. The reason he was criticized by the Pope is because Bernard of Clairvaux decided that that was, was improper. He thought that it was, it was wrong to leave students with some kind of question in their mind. Now, there's another problem that Peter Abelard encountered, and that problem had to do with his vows of chastity. He was not a priest, per se, but because he worked for the church, it was traditional that all church employees observed the laws of chastity, and therefore he was not supposed to take a wife. Also, in order to make some additional money, he did private tutoring, and he was invited by a rich person who lived in Paris to tutor this rich person's niece, and uh, the niece's name was Heloise. Over time, uh, Peter Abelard and Heloise became intimate in their relationship, and they uh, had an illegitimate son. Uh, at least he was con conceived before they were married, and then to legitimize their son, uh, there was a secret marriage performed. But Heloise's uncle didn't know that there had been a secret marriage, and when she began to show that she was pregnant, the uh, uncle took action, and he went to uh, Peter Abelard, uh, determined that he was the father of this uh, uh, son who was to be born that was, uh, in the minds of the uncle, uh, illegitimate, and he therefore uh, had Peter Abelard castrated. Well, that, of course, put an end to uh, much of the relationship between Peter and Heloise, although they confessed their love for each other, but uh, they talked about what they could do and uh, how they would continue in their lives, and they decided that they would spend the remainder, remainder of their lives as an abbot and abbess of two uh, independent monasteries, uh, both reasonably close to the city of Paris. And um, that brings us to a discussion about universities in general. Should religious universities teach all concepts or should they teach to strengthen faith? Um, this obviously has particular application here at BYU. And uh, I think an answer to that could be given by Hubie Brown, who was uh, in the first presidency. He said, Preserve, then, the freedom of your mind in education and in religion, and be unafraid to express your thoughts and to insist upon your right to examine every proposition. We are not so much concerned with whether your thoughts are orthodox or heterodox as we are that you shall have thoughts. So President Brown was encouraging us to think, 
all kinds of thoughts, uh, not necessarily to leave them unresolved, but perhaps even to leave some areas unresolved as new knowledge is gained. Well, another very famous teacher, perhaps the most famous teacher at the University of Paris, was Thomas Aquinas. He was actually born in Italy to a rather wealthy family. Uh, he was personally a large, clumsy man. We're told that he had a very large head and that as a child he was ridiculed. The story says that in his uh, classroom when he was a young boy, uh, his friends, in an attempt to poke fun at him, said to him, Thomas, look out the window, there's a cow flying. Thomas stood up, walked to the window and looked out, and as he looked out everyone laughed uproariously because of, as they said, his stupidity. Thomas turned and faced these schoolmates and said, I would rather believe my schoolmates than I would to uh, accept the fact that they were wrong and trying to ridicule me. So they all felt very bad uh, that they had in fact tried to ridicule him. Um, Thomas Aquinas um, was directed by his father to become a Benedictine monk. Uh, his uncle was a um, Benedictine abbot uh, who was very wealthy and they anticipated that Thomas would take his uncle's place. But there was a uh, war and in this war Thomas was forced to flee the Benedictine monastery and go down to the city of Naples where he would be safer. And there he went to university but also became acquainted with a Dominican group that was in the city of Naples. Remember the Dominicans uh, were a mendicant order that put their monasteries inside cities. Uh, when Thomas returned he indicated his desire to become a Dominican, thus destroying his father's image of what Thomas should do. His parents became angry and they imprisoned Thomas in his own home uh, up in a room in, the, in one of the towers and uh, while he was imprisoned, and they locked him up for an entire year, while he was imprisoned, he memorized the Bible. Uh, a very, very brilliant mind here. His, his parents became somewhat panicked at the end of the year, and they decided that they would do almost anything to get him out of his decision to become a Dominican. And therefore, they sent a prostitute into his room in hopes that the prostitute would convince Thomas to change his way, uh, perhaps by forcing him to commit a sin or enticing him to commit a sin, and then Thomas would uh, rethink his position to go into the Dominican order. But Thomas resisted the prostitute. In fact, he took a poker out of the uh, fireplace that was red hot, and he chased the prostitute from the room and carved on the uh, door uh, a symbol to remind him to be faithful to his vows and therefore he uh, was finally able to convince his parents that he should be released and become a Dominican which he did. Um, after becoming a Dominican he realized that the best place in the world for a Dominican who loved theology would be to go to the University of Paris and that's exactly what he did. There he studied under a very famous teacher named Albert the Great or if you like Albertus Magnus in the Latin. Thomas became an expert in languages, literature, astronomy, mathematics and theology. Uh, Thomas later taught at three universities and in subsequent years when the uh, magnificence of his reasoning and his theological treatments of Catholic doctrine became well known. Uh, a pope named him Doctor of the Church. That's the highest possible position for a theologian within the Catholic Church. He uh, gave certain questions and answers uh, using the scholastic method and uh, one of those would be, for instance, why did Christ come to earth? That is, why was there an incarnation of Christ or of God in the Catholic view uh, as Christ? Uh, here is a, a short video done by a, a monk uh, 
and he is talking about and teaching the philosophy of Aquinas. And I think it's interesting to see how the Catholic Church today continues to teach the concepts of Thomas Aquinas. Ave Maria, welcome to the Cornerstone, our series on the motive for the incarnation. Why did the Word become flesh? And reflections on the practical implications of that. We're continuing our look at St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor. And as we noted before, St. Thomas held as a more probable opinion. He preferred that if man had not sinned, the Word would not have become flesh. So for him, the primary reason, the cause of the incarnation was sin, man's need to have a remedy for sin. But he'd also held that the other opinion, which has come to be known as the Franciscan thesis held by Blessed John Duns Scotus, was also probable. I'd like to read you a quote from his commentary on the sentences. He writes, <clears throat> Others, however, say that since not only redemption from sin, but also the exaltation of human nature and the consummation of the entire universe was accomplished by the Incarnation, therefore, if there had been no sin, he would have become incarnate for these reasons. And this opinion, says St. Thomas, can also be called probable. So why this great respect for the opposite opinion when he leaned towards the no sin, no incarnation opinion? Thomas wrote over 40 books and several hymns, and his great work was called Summa Theologica. It is an encyclopedic work that treats essentially all of the doctrine of the Catholic Church. And it is upon his teachings that most of the doctrine of the Catholic Church is founded today. In that teaching, Thomas Aquinas used Aristotelian logic and Aristotelian philosophy. Um, here's an example of one of the interesting proofs given by Thomas Aquinas in his works. He said, Things are in motion, hence there is a first mover. Things are caused, hence there is a first cause. Things exist, hence there is a creator. Perfect goodness exists, hence there is a sorcerer. Things are designed, hence they serve a purpose. As one of the project, and I'm not sure what school this student project was done in. Here is a student project talking about the proofs of God's existence done by Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was a Roman Catholic theologian who lived in the 13th century and is to this day considered by the church to be pretty much an example of the ideal Catholic. Aquinas spent much of his life agonizing over the question of the existence of God and being a Catholic monk it's unsurprising which answer he leaned towards. Being a great fan of Aristotle, Aquinas took a lot of Aristotle's philosophies and applied them to his own work. He thought Aristotle was a pretty awesome guy. Aquinas believed that there were two ways to arrive at the truth. Some things could be understood through reason and logic, other things through faith and that's perfectly possible to prove the existence of God a priori, or through reason alone. He formulated five proofs known as the Kinke Vie, I think that's how it's pronounced, and some more convincing others, and some of which are still hotly debated by theologians and atheists alike. The first proof is the first mover argument. We can observe that anything that moves must be set in motion by something else that was moving to begin with, and that thing in turn was set in motion by something else, which was set in motion by something else. Aquinas argued that there must have been a first mover, that which was not itself moved, otherwise nothing would ever have begun moving to begin with. The second proof is the first cause, which states that anything that is created must be created by something else because nothing can create itself. But if nothing ever created itself, then nothing would ever have been created in the first place and the universe would fail to exist. Therefore, there must have been a creator, itself not created, which caused the existence of everything else. Proof three is the argument of contingency, which states that things that we observe today are not necessary to exist, but if nothing was necessary, then nothing would exist. Therefore, something must be necessary and that would be God. Proof four argues that for us to judge anything to be either good or bad, we must compare it against something that is better, although for this to be anything but entirely arbitrary, there must exist something that is the best possible thing. Finally, proof five is that we can observe that everything in the universe, alive or otherwise, works towards some kind of goal, but for this to be true, there must be some kind of supreme intelligence directing the whole show. Aquinas' philosophical writings are one of the best ever attempts at grounding the Judeo-Christian faith in logical reasoning, and the Catholic Church thought this was pretty great. Aquinas believed that theology was a science, and attempted to formulate arguments supporting the Church's doctrine on the grounds of rational thinking.
Church loved Thomas Aquinas so much that they made him a saint, and in Christian tradition it's often regarded that the only person who knew Christianity better was Jesus. So we can now ask the question, did universities improve creativity? Well, they certainly got people thinking more, and they got th people thinking in broader terms, not just memorization as was done in the abbeys, but didactic questioning and answer, study, research, struggling to find new truths. Uh, there was also a requirement that these truths be reconciled with Catholic theology. Uh, nevertheless, new truths were discovered and theology was expanded. The university certainly had uh, an important part in doing that. Thank you. Appreciate your attention. We can ask ourselves then, in your own mind, is BYU improving your creativity? Thank you again.